Hello and welcome to a special discussion with the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. He is also the founder of the Global Shapers Community, Professor Klaus Schwab. Hi. We are also joined by the head of the Global Shapers Community, Wadia Eid Hamza. Hi, Wadia. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Professor. As you know, the Global Shapers community is a network of over 15,000 young people driving dialogue, action, and change in 450 hubs in 150 countries around the world. And this year, we celebrate a major milestone, our 10-year anniversary. And to commemorate this moment, Wadi and I are so excited to engage with you, Professor Schwab, in a conversation about our community's progress and the course ahead. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Wadi, why don't you kick things off? Thank you, Natalie. Hi again, Professor. It's so great to have you for another special uh, discussion. This year, as you know, we are celebrating the 10th year anniversary of our incredible community. As part of the celebration, we are asking global shapers to share their stories, the story of stories on what brought them to the global shapers community. But we would like to start from the very beginning to hear your story, Professor, why and how you launched the global shapers community. I remember the moment of the birth of the global shapers community very well. Back in 2011, when I created uh, the global shapers community, I was so proud because I felt I'm doing something which is so important to give the young people a voice. The community has become a formidable force of change in the world. In 2011, uh, it was a simple idea. Uh, give young people under the age of uh, 30 a seat at the table in discussions that concern all people in the world and the future of our planet. At this time, young people were facing enormous global challenges. Insecurity and no good jobs erupted with tremendous force in the Occupy and Indignarnos movements. And the movements in the Mediterranean, young protesters around the world were frustrated rightly, by inaction and had a right to be deeply concerned and even angry about the future they were inheriting from my generation. I wanted to do something. The way I saw it, young people were the most important and most affected stakeholders when talking about our future. So the young people are the people who have the most innovative ideas and also energy to really shape the future and to build a better society for tomorrow. So I wanted to give them an opportunity. I wanted to use the power of the World Economic Forum also for the benefit and particularly for the benefit of the young generation. In 2011, we invited young people, the first ever shapers, to our annual meeting of the new champions in China. And the next year, we had our first youth delegation in Davos. At this time, we were just a few hundred members and maybe a few dozen uh, hubs, but momentum grew very quickly because the idea uh, had got, let's say, the support of the young generations. And heads of state, city mayors, and even CEOs that spoke, uh, I spoke to, were eager to support the movement. And by the end of the year, we aim to celebrate the opening of our half a thousand uh, city-based hubs. The growth of the community has been truly remarkable, and that's what I'm maybe most proud of in my life. 
500 hubs. I can't believe it, Professor Schwab. That is a tremendous amount of growth and a huge achievement. When we talk about growth, we must also talk about diversity when it comes to the Global Shapers community. We know Global Shapers are from all walks of life. They are diverse in terms of education, expertise, income, and nationality. And it's so important to us that every Global Shaper, from Atlanta to Accra, from Zagreb to Zurich, feels a sense of belonging and also empowerment. So I'm curious, Professor Schwab, how important were representation and inclusion to you when you were thinking about the development of the Global Shapers community? Natalie, this is a, a crucial question. And when I answer these questions, I actually have to go back in history uh, to the time when I created the World Economic Forum. The concept which was, let's say, my uh, guiding principle, and actually, to a certain extent, I'm the uh, person who wrote first about the concept. The concept is a stakeholder concept. And the stakeholder concept means you belong to a community. And everybody should be equal in the community. And our own destiny is very much interconnected with the community. So. When I studied in uh, the States and in Europe, and I was roughly the age, actually, of Global Shapers. Uh, and when I grew up, I always was thinking, maybe based on the experiences which I had during, uh, let's say, still experiencing the World War II, how can we create a more equal, more just uh, society? The stakeholder concept means that everybody has a stake in the corporation and everybody is better off if he or she contributes to the future of the corporation. We are all together jointly and we cannot leave someone out because he is different. I think every voice should be heard. That's the concept which I believe in. That's so amazing, Professor, and, and the community uh, is living by those values of diversity. But it's not always easy, and we know that you've long advocated for intergenerational parity and young people's involvement in the decision-making. You've met probably all head of states over the past 50 years, as well as CEOs, head of global organizations. How have you convinced them to have young people engaged and involved uh, in the decision-making? The average age or the median age in the world is around 30 or even below 30. Mm -hmm. And the decision-making is in the hands or mainly of older people. I think if, if you take the stakeholder concept and you apply it to our global future. Of course, you have to integrate business leaders, you have to integrate mm -hmm. civil society, you have to integrate academics, because we should always be in search of the truth. But we should integrate those who really represent the majority, which means the young generation. So there is a big change today. Mm. The young generation, is much more tuned in into this fast exponential development of change which we have in the world. And I think they should not only have a seat at the table, they can contribute quite a lot when we talk about tomorrow. But if you look today around in the world, you see so many young people really in key positions. So to summarize again, it's absolutely essential to drive the world into this direction. But I think we need also generational um, parity. parity. You see that we have a tendency to think short term and to solve our present issues by transferring the load to the next, next generation. generation. I mean, Look at the environment. 
I'm so happy. There was one, one verdict of the German uh, federal court, which uh, just uh, um, in the last days said, look, what you politicians are doing is not enough in terms of uh, fighting climate change. <laughs> because you leave too much of the burden to the next generation. generation. You have to act now. That's what I want to see. Hmm. And that action now is something that is a tremendous strength of the Global Shapers community. Um, we see projects around the world, and this year alone we saw over a thousand local projects to strengthen communities. And that sense of urgency and agency is something that's so present with our community since it was founded, and it will be the guiding principle that carries us forward. Um, Professor, I want to ask you a question. You've talked about um, the last 50 years, the guiding principles behind um, when you founded the World Economic Forum. And when I look at you, Professor Schwab, obviously you founded the Forum. You founded the Global Shapers community. You also founded the Forum of Young Global Leaders and the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, which is incredible. You have published books. You're an economist, you're an engineer, and so much more. But I want to dig a little bit deeper into the man who is behind the founder, the accolades and the achievements. And I wanted to ask you, Professor Schwab, at any moment, are you overwhelmed by the state of the world or your responsibilities? Um, and if so, how do you remain so committed to your work? If you look back, I mean, uh, people uh, today, particularly caused by the pandemic, have a tendency to be depressed, to be pessimistic. And we see all this polarization in the world. I'm optimistic because if you go back, um, even uh, let's say the last 50 years since I created the World Economic Forum, we have seen so much progress in humankind, um, particularly also benefiting the young generation. Uh, just look at the literacy rate in the world. Uh, even if I look at uh, poverty, um, when, when I created the Forum in 71, we were roughly about 3 billion people in the world. And uh, there were about 1 um, billion people who were below the poverty line. Today, we are over 7 billion people. And of course, there are still close to one billion people who are left behind. But in relative terms, we have made progress. And think of the new um, possibilities of the young generation in terms they are interconnected with the world. They have access to all the knowledge which we have in the world. That was not the case 50 years ago. So. I'm, I'm optimistic about the future. Look just now at the pandemic. I mean, who could have imagined that um, in something uh, around, in, in, in around 300 days, a vaccine was developed. Uh, we're using a completely new method, the mRNA method. So the world is full of opportunities and what we have to do is to make sure that we, we use those opportunities, but we use them in a very responsible way. And the community of the young global shapers, I think, should teach also that you have a global responsibility, but in order to have the license to speak out and um, you, you also have to take care of your local community. I think the fact, as you just mentioned, Natalie, that we have now over 1,000 projects, that fulfills me with pride because it shows that you are not only engaged in shaping the world in worlds, but that you start on the community level yeah. to do something to make sure so that we can look with an optimistic perspective into our future. And Professor, talking of that, and as you know, we will be celebrating our 
10th year anniversary uh, later in, in, in the year. What is, or would love to hear, what is your proudest moment uh, of building this Global Shapers community? I owe the, the Shapers a lot, uh, I mean, of experiences, um, funny moments, but also moments where I experienced the true commitment of those people into what I believe uh, is really valuable in life. And um, if I had to define what is valuable in life, uh, look, in economics or in, 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 in the business life, if you take a balance sheet of a company, mm -hmm. you are successful if you take much more out yes. um, than what you spend. That's your profit, that's a surplus. But in your private life, if you want to leave a legacy, it's just, you have to flip it around. You have to give more than you take in. That's my advice uh, to everybody. And if everybody would behave in such a way, what fantastic, it would be nearly paradise on earth. And that's what actually the Global Shapers are doing. They are giving more exactly. from what they have to their local communities. Yeah. That's, I, I think it's not just doing something and having a project. I think it's a whole mindset which yeah. goes with it. It's a whole philosophy which you learn from this experience of being engaged together with the community in solving a very concrete issue mm -hmm. in a local, national context. And Professor, if you have one thing that you would like Global Shapers to go with from this discussion, what is, will it be? I, th I think um, there are a number of issues, so a number of uh, advices. The first one is, of course, to believe into our future. And uh, the future is not happening. The future is constructed by us. us. It's us who, who are uh, responsible for our future. That's what distinguishes us from, let's say, other creatures in the world. So that's number one. Number two, to feel always part of a community and to know that if the community does well, you will also do well. If the community, let's say, fails, uh, you will also suffer. And number three, uh, when I look at um, leadership, I think we, we call them uh, global shapers, but in some way we want some to become global leaders. So we have to ask ourselves, what creates leadership? Um, but for me, having met uh, most or practically every leader in the last 50 years, I think it, it boils down to a very simple concept. A leader has to have brain, soul, heart, muscles, and good nerves. Hmm. Let me just, uh, let me just um, uh, elaborate. Um, if you want to be a leader, you have to be a professional. You, you have to know what you are doing. Um, you, you will not know everything. You, yeah. you still have to take risks, but you have to be a professional. That's the brain. And then you have to have a soul, which means some guiding principle, some compass. Mm. And the compass can be based on deep values, which you have. And it can be based also on a vision which you have of the future. But in any case, you know in which direction hmm. uh, you want to go. The uh, heart is the energy, the passion which you, you have behind of what we are doing. Um, when I was a professor, students came to me and said, um, what should I do? Should I go into industry? Should I go into banking? Should I become an entrepreneur? I said, that's not a relevant question. Hmm. You have first to ask the question, 
what am I passionate about it? Because yeah. if you are passionate about something, you will you succeed. Know. If you are not passionate, you will yeah. not only suffer, but you will not succeed. Yeah. And finally, you have to have some muscles. You have to be able to translate your vision into action. And today you need good nerves. When I ask uh, people who is combining all those five, it's the only person who really, in my opinion, in an optimal way combined all the five, brains, soul, heart, muscles, and good nerves, was uh, Mandela. Hmm. He always impressed me by bringing uh, out all those five dimension in his um, personality. Thank you, Professor Schwab, and thank you, Wadia, for sharing both your insights and also the story behind the Global Shapers community. You've always been a man with a tremendously clear and courageous purpose, and you've passed that on to Global Shapers around the world to improve the state of the world one community at a time. Whatever you do and when you are uh, very engaged. Uh, you still have moments uh, where, you, where you are tested yeah. and where you have to live up to your values. I, I give you one example which for me was probably a crucial moment in my life. I traveled for the first time uh, to Brazil. I met a priest uh, who was known at that time as the priest of the poor people. Hmm. Uh, his name was Don Elder Camara. And he brought me to the favelas of uh, Recife, and I was so shocked. And I said, I have to invite this bishop to Davos hmm. to tell the people what poverty is. So I invited him to, to, to the annual meeting in Davos, but some when I came back in Switzerland, I found out that actually he was forbidden at that time Ooh. to speak in Switzerland because he was considered to be a communist. And I said, this is for me a test. But then I noticed that many companies told me, if you invite this person who is so much against business, we will not come to Davos anymore. And that's where I had to stand to my values. Yeah. Even at the risk that I would have to give up uh, the World Economic Forum. Wow. Um, but it went very well. Uh, I have to say, um, the audience in Davos listened to him. But unfortunately, even today, 40 years later, we still have so much poverty and in inequalities. And I know that many, many of the initiatives of the, of the Global Shapers are actually just aiming yes. uh, alleviating poverty and making sure that people are not so much yeah. left behind. It's an important lesson in what it means to be a bridge builder, to close divides and have courageous conversations, even when it's difficult to yeah. do. And, uh, and it's also a lesson, lesson in inclusion. Yeah. You have to listen to the voices which may be in, in uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I think that's, the, that's key, to listen to voices which may be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean? Say, test your thinking. And you may adapt your thinking and find a better way to shape the future. Thank you, Professor Schwab, and thank you, Wadia. Yeah. On that note, to our viewers, you can visit globalshapers.org or follow us on social media with the hashtag globalshapers10 to join our 10-year anniversary celebrations, to continue the conversation around the world in your hubs, um, and see how you can further engage with us. Thank you.